Hey, you are listening to Intuit from Vulture. I'm your host, Sam Sanders. And this episode... We have a lot of good stuff for y'all. You're going to hear from two Vulture TV critics talking about the best TV of 2022, as well as talking about why watching TV these days can feel so exhausting. We also have some White Lotus Who Did It theories. But first, before all of that, we're going to play a game because that's how we do it here. I've got two of Vulture's finest to play this week. Morgan, Zoe, hi. Tell folks who you are and what you do at Vulture. Hello. I'm Zoe Hala, Vulture's Deputy News Editor. And I'm Morgan Bela, and I'm the Senior News Editor. And all we do is talk about TV and things like White Lotus all day. Sounds like the best job. <laughs> no complaints. If being on Twitter all day is your idea of the best job, then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we're not well, but we're having fun. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think you both have either heard of this game or played it before. It's called Into It, Not Into It. We uh, talk about three stories from the week in the zeitgeist, in the pop culture realm. And you just tell me if you're into this story or not and why. And at the end of the game, I will pick a winner based on how much I like their opinions. Oh, it's a competition. Okay. Oh, it's a competition. <laughs> it's a competition. All right, first question. Are y'all into or not into a casino in Times Square owned by Jay-Z? I'm so, so far from into this. I'm out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a new term for the game. Into it, not into it, or out of it. <laughs> We're out of this one. So this is from the wrap up and they wrote, quote, the billionaire rapper and his company Rock Nation have joined an investment group to open the first full scale casino in New York City's Times Square. According to a press release, Rock Nation will help revitalize Times Square by partnering with neighborhood organizations to reimagine programming in the tourist destination. Jay-Z himself said We have the opportunity to create a destination at the heart of Times Square. Does Times Square need revitalizing? I think it needs to calm down. (laughs) Like, it's already an attraction that lots of people go to. Too many, some might say. Imagine saying, yeah, Times Square should be busier, and I'm really brave to say it. And I'm about to profit off of it. Yeah. (laughs) Also, of all the vices to bring into Times Square... I'm not sure gambling is going to make Times Square any better. Uh Uh-uh. Bring mini golf. Bring pickleball. If Jay-Z pivoted to mini golf, I do think that that's a a multi-million empire that he's missing out on. I mean, I would love to do, like, go-kart and then go to the Times Square Olive Garden. Oh, that's a rom-com opening scene right there. (laughs) Give me that. Okay, though, so, but if there had to be a casino in Times Square, which celebrity or any person would you most <laughs> want to see run the Times Square casino? Um, I would go if Mike White opened it and it was season three of White Lotus. <laughs> <laughs> in Times yes. Square. <laughs> I would murder someone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Z- Zoe guest stars. Okay, next question. Are y'all into or not into... T.J. Holmes and Amy Robach getting benched temporarily from hosting Good Morning America because of their relationship. It's been all over. We got to talk about it. How are you feeling about that? Into it or not? So into it. Into the relationship or the benching? The suspension, the relationship. (laughs) What are you into? We need clarifications. Um, I mean, like, what are you not into? I mean, for me, I think that They saw that there was a dry spell of really good gossip. And then they reminded us that not only that GMA3 exists, but also (laughs) that, like, (laughs) consensual workplace drama does exist. And I think that was really important. At least (laughs) that we know of so far. Who knows how this ages? But if it was, like, the first hour of GMA, I don't know if I'd be into it. (laughs) That's too mainstream. (laughs) I want to point out here, the third hour of Good Morning America starts at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
<laughs> it's good afternoon, America. Anywho, go ahead, Zoe. I think the suspension was probably a little too late and that we could have been getting some like juicy gossip on air while they were figuring it all out. But it's probably a good idea, both for their personal lives and actually getting the show on the rails, whatever that is to them. I will say it really hurts me to admit this, but TJ Holmes is one of the most beautiful men in TV news. I think he knows that, too. (laughs) (laughs) That seems to be the air around him. But yeah, he is. He is. He knows. We know. Amy knows. Look at me. I've well, you've been training. You've been training. With you. And I run behind you and you keep the pace. I don't have to worry about these things. <laughs> right. So uh, if you are the pacer, yes. you do have to worry about these things. You're the pacer. That may be the pacey. Yes. Yeah, you're the pacey. Okay. So yeah. But we're going to both be finishers. And that's what counts. Last question for you both. Are you into or not into this new Megan and Harry Netflix documentary? No one knows the full truth. We know the full truth. I'm kind of into it. I want to see what their next move is. <sighs> okay. I'm honestly more into how the firm, William and Kate, are going to react. Yeah, yeah. Morgan? I'm not into it because I listened to Megan's Archetypes podcast and it was not it. People should expect the real me in this and probably the me that they've never gotten to know, certainly not in the past few years, um, where everything is through the lens of the media as opposed to, hey, it's me. I do not have high hopes (laughs) for this to be anything but PR. I don't think we're going to see as much like real, raw drama gossip that we slash I require (laughs) in a docuseries these days. Yeah. You know, my thing with this whole thing, I support Meghan and Harry. I support the idea of Meghan and Harry. I'm all about leaving the monarchy. I'm all about that. But at a certain point, can I say this? I'm, I want them to stop talking about it. I'm tired of yeah. hearing about this. So, like, because, like, their whole thing was we had to leave the monarchy to get away from all the drama. Yeah. But then they leave and keep talking about the drama. But they're not even giving us, like, good drama like it's just all rehashing and it's like we have the crown it will be rehashed like we're good (laughs) they do kind of lose me at the six parts six parts is a lot it's six wait wait stop it's it's six (laughs) parts oh god no like three yes six yeah what six no and like if i were them and i'm not i'd be like how can i make a career shift that makes you ultimately forget that I was ever a royal. To your point, what I think that Megan should do is she should revive the TIG, her lifestyle blog, as one of the original influencers and do a docuseries about her full pivot to being an influencer. I want to know how much, you know, Joe Malone would pay her to post an Instagram story of her fragrance. You know, I want to know actually what her celebrity status translates to now. And then I think that (laughs) Harry should buy a soccer team and make a whole docuseries about it oh. just like Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds. <laughs> yeah <laughs> why not why not why I need not? an influencer and I need a sports team owner out of them we gotta we need move a on. new plot line we gotta move on yes we gotta move on all right we're gonna declare a winner with this next little mini segment we're gonna do just now for this episode we gotta talk White Lotus <laughs> the season's not done yet but I want to ask these two White Lotus heads with me now to offer their predictions. And I will declare the winner of the whole game today based on whose prediction I like the best. Who do you think was killed? Wow. And who do you think did it? Go. Zoe, you go first. Oh, my goodness. This is a lot. I have to bring out my pegboard with all the strings. But <laughs> I have been latching on to a sort of like optimistic theory that maybe the body in the water, at least, or one of the bodies, is Quentin. I'd also die for beauty, wouldn't you? Hmm. A world without beauty. It's not a world I want to live in. 
Wow. He was the one who mentioned to Tanya the lore behind a woman who didn't want to give up her house to the public. And oh, her, yeah, 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 yeah. She ended up dead, body strewn on the rocks at the bottom of her island. So I think that could happen to him because he also doesn't want to give up the house and have it open to the public. He's doing all this scheming to somehow try to keep it. And maybe that means my girl Tanya is some kind of hero and saves herself from the sticky situation she seems to be in. Maybe you should slow down with this guy. Why? Something about his relationship with his uncle. I like that. Okay. Morgan, what's your theory? Well, wait, so Zoe, the mafia would kill him? Oh, maybe the mafia kills him. I keep forgetting that we're, that that's a whole other <laughs> villain. I tweeted earlier, but on TikTok, there's so much analyzing of, like, the paintings on the walls, like, the, mm-hmm. the opening track, like, sequencing. Well, we know paintings are important because the opening credits are replicas of frescoes. Paintings that are shown in the show are also in the trailer. And I think Mike White made an amazing show but i do not think he is going that deep with it and to me the simplest answer would be like ethan and cameron having some kind of like confrontation now um, ethan and cameron so okay here's my thing with white lotus i know all their faces i know none of the characters names who are those that's two? so fair <laughs> well when you know them like i know them sam it's just like they're friends of mine yeah, yeah. um the two guys that everyone wants to hook up but they're not going to Aubrey Plaza's husband and not Aubrey oh, Plaza's. Yeah. Theo gotcha, James gotcha, is gotcha. Will Sharp. I love you. I just want to be inside you. No, thank you. Please. No, ma'am. I want to do stuff to you. No. I want to make you feel good. But then now everyone's been obsessing over that the leg looks shaved, which who's to say that those men don't shave their legs? I don't know. But now I'm like, oh, does that mean... It's a woman. Who knows? So yeah. if it's a woman, I don't know. Because Zoe, okay. you agree. I think I think broad picture, I think a man dies. I think so too. Okay. I think I think if a man okay. doesn't die, I will feel my time has been wasted. Correct. I hope that Aubrey Plaza's character gets to kill somebody because I want to see Aubrey Plaza act out that scene. <laughs> yes. She could. I totally agree. And I feel like she could totally kill Cameron and that's why Ethan's kind of spinning out imagining that they're getting close and I think it's because Aubrey's character knows like a long con when she sees one at some point he is going to approach you with some kind of money making scheme or some kind of favor or something there's a reason they invited us here I feel like she's like looking out Okay, well, with that, I think we agree on a lot. We all support the very idea of Aubrey Plaza doing whatever. And I'm going to just go ahead and say you're both winners. You've both won the game. Aubrey Plaza wins at life. And the Four Seasons Resort actually wins everything because they are the location for both White Lotus Season 1 and 2. They got a lot of promo out of this thing. So do we, we, we win a free trip to the Four Seasons. Me Thank and you. <laughs> Y'all win a free trip to Four Seasons Total Landscaping. That <laughs> Remember that one? <laughs> Morgan and Zoe, tell folks again who you are, where to find you, what to do, all the good things. Go. I'm Zoe Haylock, Vulture's Deputy News Editor. I'm on Twitter, Zoe underscore Aliyah. And I'm Morgan Bela. I'm Vulture's Senior News Editor. I'm on Twitter at Morgan Bela. And thanks for having us, Sam. All righty. Uh... Roxana, Catherine, we're going to talk about TV right now. The best TV of 2022, in fact, because you two are Vulture's TV critics and there's literally no one better to have this chat with. As we begin, I want you both to introduce yourselves to our listeners. Tell them who you are and what you do. Um... My name is Catherine Van Arendonk. I am a critic at Vulture. I write about TV. I also write about stand-up comedy. I write features sometimes. I write um, very silly uh, lists and blurbs sometimes. Um, But most of the time, it's TV. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yeah. My name is Roxana Haddadi. I'm a TV critic for Vulture. I also write about film, pop culture, uh, and every so often, just like thirsty diatribes. So thirsty. Yeah. Wait, wait, what was the last yeah. thirsty diatribe? Got to know. 
I think I wrote one about Timothy Oliphant in The Mandalorian. Yeah. Okay. And like how wonderful it was to see him in any iteration and then how irritating it was what happened to his character. Aha, uh-huh, aha. Uh-huh. Yeah, a whole journey. So let's just talk TV, best TV of the year. But, you know, I feel like I cannot talk about TV I loved this year without also talking about how difficult it's felt to watch TV right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I had to sum it up, 2022 was the year of me feeling like the state of TV is just simply too much. Mm -hmm. Couldn't keep up. Too many shows. And then when I wanted to really dig into a show, it seemed really hard to find a thing to grab onto. Yep. All of it was so exhausting more than any other year it felt. And I found myself many nights watching the like Netflix homepage screensaver that just shows you photos from all the shows that you could watch. And that was more enjoyable to me than the process of figuring out what the hell to watch and how to watch it. Was 2022 the year of like peak streaming fatigue? Or am I alone? I think it was peak fatigue in general. (laughs) Like I think it was TV related. Yeah. But... Uh, I mean, it felt like a lot of our, like, pop culture certainties of the past few years sort of just hit a wall. Mm. Um, There was certainly a lot of TV more than anyone could humanly watch. But then every so often there would be, yes, many nights where I would say, like, is there just a Law & Order from 20 years ago that I could watch? Is that that possible? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that I think is, I mean, there's like a billion reasons for it. But this year felt particularly like a major calendar scheduling problem. Like there were a couple of months this spring where we were just looking at the calendars and thinking there is no physical way anyone could ever watch (laughs) even one episode of all of these shows. And as a result, like the moments when you really needed some guidance, we couldn't even offer it because we were still scrambling to try to watch everything. I mean, I think a good indication of this is that Julia Roberts, who is a still, I think, bona fide movie star. Ticket to Paradise, loved it. You know, Ticket to Paradise has done really well. She was in a mini series about like a Nixon era oh, scandal snap, that was. nobody watched but me. <laughs> she was. I was the only one. <laughs> oh wow. So yeah, it feels like so much stuff just got lost. Yep. So I mean, I guess like honestly though, like, is there anyone that I can fight over this? Is anyone gonna offer us a solution? Is this just the way it is and deal with it like forever now? I mean I, I yeah, it is. It, there is this sense that I think a lot of us have had for a couple of years now where it's like a, streaming is a pyramid scheme built <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> on the promise of an ever-increasing subscriber base. And at some point, yeah. you can't make more subscribers except by giving birth to them, right? <laughs> I wouldn't put that past Netflix. Wow, I wouldn't put that past Netflix. <laughs> wow. Now that we've gotten all the negative stuff out of the way, let's talk about the positive stuff. You two sent us over list of your favorite TV shows from this past year. Uh, but we're going to talk right now about three of them that you both watched and loved that our listeners can go into the holidays and watch if they haven't already. We're going to talk about them in any order you choose, but just know when it comes to one of them, I will have angry thoughts. The shows. Oh, no, we know. We know, Sam. (laughs) You know. We're aware. (laughs) The three shows are Reservation Dogs, Pachinko, and Lord God, The Bear. (laughs) The Bear. (laughs) Sam, it sounds like you want to talk about The Bear. I I, yeah, do you want to do that first? Let's do the bear first. Let's do the Let's bear first. Y'all like the bear? Tell me why. <laughs> I I love the bear. I do like too. a lot. Yeah. Like a ton. I guess first tell folks what the show is and what it's about if they haven't heard about it already, uh, besides the really tight white t-shirts. The bear first of all, the tight white t-shirts are essential. But <laughs> the bear is uh it's on FX on Hulu. Uh it is a dramedy, I guess if we want to use that term about a young chef whose brother dies by suicide and he inherits the uh, like Chicago beef sandwich shop that the brother ran. 
and basically is dealing with his own grief and confusion over his brother's death uh, and the very tangible problems that arise, which are that the restaurant is in a massive amount of debt. I'm still trying to figure this place out. You know, see how, how Michael was doing everything. And I want to get you your money. Yeah, 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 no, I miss him. Uh, I miss him too. The staff is sort of dysfunctional. Uh, and they sort of butt up against Carmi, the protagonist's attempts to make the restaurant better. And that's why we are going to start operating like a French kitchen. That means there's going to be a chain of command. Okay, this was developed by Escoffier, and I think... Oh, Escoffier? <laughs> Love that dude. <laughs> what's up? I don't know what's going on. My sort of personal reason for liking the show is that I lost my father last year. And so this sense of like inexplicable sort of grief and trying to throw yourself into work to deal with that spoke to me a lot. Uh, And also I just really enjoyed the structure of the show. I thought the ensemble was very good. I loved the one take episode. Fuck off my expo chef now! Get the fuck off! Thank you! We're firing 76 beasts! So for me, it hit a lot of the stuff that I'm looking for in TV, which is, you know, a program that asks questions that sort of forces you to reckon with who you are, which maybe is projecting and asking too much of television, but it's generally the stuff that I like. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I uh, really generally find it hard to watch shows that make me anxious, and The Bear <laughs> is an exception to that. I mean, the, sh- the the most of The Bear is about a guy staring at a clock or a stove that's on fire or a ledger where all of the numbers are in minus territory. Fire! But it is a show, and it moves very, very fast. And the, like, fast-paced restaurantness of it is very well calibrated to make me feel like ripping my hair out. And I think the performances are incredible. I think the writing is really strong. I think it has I, – I tend to really resonate with very distinctive sense of place. Um, and there are many complaints about how realistic the Chicago is. Well, and I, that place in Chicago. Like that neighborhood yes, is actually already full That particular neighborhood in Chicago, yeah. which I completely understand and I'm sure are completely correct. Instead, what I have is the really gorgeous cinematography – um, and, you know, Hiro Murai was one of the executive producers on this show. I think you can see the look of his work all over it. I tend to like his work very, very much. And um, folks might know him from other things like... Like Station Eleven and and Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Or the two yeah. biggies. Uh, and so that, you know, is is immediately appealing for me. I think the other thing is that... It has a core cheesiness that I am not above. That, like, (laughs) as this show goes on, you're like, oh, these people don't like each other, but they're going to become a family. And wouldn't you know it, like, that is where this goes at the end. And I I want, I I have a desire for that when it is well executed. And this show does it. It does it. Okay. Can I tell y'all my thoughts? On Le Bear. Yes. <laughs> um, I think some of it was done really well, but I think most of the show for me felt like a missed opportunity. Mm. The show begins and you've got these two loud, ruggedly handsome, kind of grungy white guys who scream and scream and yell and yell and yell and like, you get enough of them by episode two. And I kept waiting once I saw the ensemble of the cast in that show, I kept waiting for the orange as a new black moment Mm. where you think the show was about the white people, but it's actually about the people of color. Mm. And they never fully did that. They never fully gave the show to AO. They never fully gave the show to the rest of the team, which I found more interesting. And I think they could have done that more than they did. And I think that having Hmm. to listen to the two of them, the 
two leads yell the whole time. By the end, it was tiring. And I'm over this trope of like male actors thinking they're acting well just because they're screaming. Mm. Well, for what it's worth, I think the best performance at the end from uh, from the lead is actually the part where he says nothing at all and is just sitting yeah. silently in a church for a long time. Yes. So yeah. I wouldn't want to reduce these performances to just screaming, although you're right, there is a great deal of that. And the more he wouldn't respond and the more our relationship kind of strained, the deeper into this I went and the better I got. And the more people I cut out, the quieter my life got. I mean, it's getting a season two. The thing, Sam, that you have criticized could be okay. redeemed and addressed in a second season. Make it the Sydney show. If if they make the Bear season two the Sydney show, I'll be fully on board. All right. And with that, let's go to the next show. Y'all pick Reservation Dogs or Pachinko. Uh, well, let's pivot to a different feeling kind of a thing and do Pachinko next. Pachinko is an adaptation of an epic Korean family drama novel, and it is an Apple TV Plus show, came out very beginning of the year, and the premise of the story is there is a young Korean woman. It is at the moment of the uh, Japanese-occupied Korea. She grows up and uh, gets married and eventually goes to spend most of her adult life in Japan. And then some of the story is also when she is a much older woman, her grandson, um, who feels very lost in sort of who he is and and what he wants, um, has gone to the United States to get like a very fancy business degree and come back and is, is trying to figure out how to like really make it. They need that hotel. That's in Tokyo. Where one landowner, one, holds the entire deal hostage. I know, but I'm telling you, I can close that deal. It is very different. For, I have, although I have not read the book, I have now read quite a bit about like the difference between how the show is structured and how the book is structured, because that is also a source of some. I don't want to say controversy, but it is hmm. always this big question about when. There is a very famous first work and then an adapted work that is quite different, whether that is a good or a bad thing or how we feel about it or how we judge the ad- adaptation. And there is a, a significantly different like narrative design. The stories are not v- all that different, but as far as the order of how they get told and when information is revealed, that is quite different. And I am in general – and in this specific case, always really, really here for it when your adaptations make strong choices that are very different than the original. Catherine, something I really liked in your Pachinko review is that you said you could watch this television show forever, Yeah, right? That you thought that the structure and the family epic style of it allowed for this kind of story to unfurl generation by generation, sure. yeah. right? So I think that was one of the things that was really... Uh, impactful for me is the sense that you are getting all aspects of this family and how like specific circumstances are internalized and reacted to differently by different people, even if they grew up in the same familial structure. Yeah. I mean, I have a real soft spot for this particular kind of, of long form storytelling that TV actually does not do very much of anymore. And I think family epics are not just really fascinating ways to talk about all kinds of experiences of humanity and history, but also like just great TV structure. So hearing you both talk so positively about this show, Pachinko, I'm realizing I didn't hear too much about it this year. Mm. 
Was this show perhaps the victim of peak streaming? Did oh, yeah. it get lost in the sauce this year? I also think it was the victim of Squid Game. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people wait, were like, explain. I can only watch one Asian-related show. Oh, well, they need to open their minds. They do. They really need to. But it, it sort of it sort of felt like that because mm. it was this very, I thought, immaculately put together, everything you wanted a prestige TV, beautifully shot, mm. nuanced writing, wonderful performances. Mm. It just felt like nobody was watching, which could be an Apple TV Plus problem. I do well, think this that is it a is— thing. Yeah, yeah. like it's a streamer that I think is making a solid impact with its programming, but I'm not sure how many people see it as a destination yet. Which you is know? crazy because when I think of my favorite show this year, it was an Apple Plus TV show, Severance. Mm -hmm. I thought that show was brilliant mm -hmm. and everyone who watched it thought it was brilliant. And yet something about it, I can love that show. And I did. And I still don't actually think about Apple TV Plus. I don't think about them. Interesting. Wow, that's a really a like, a, like a full Don Draper. Like I don't think about <laughs> I don't think you about you at all. Yeah, yeah. I feel bad for you. I don't think about you at all. That said, man, Severance. No yeah. notes. Eleven out of ten. Damn good show. <laughs> Damn good show. Severance yeah. is good. It was talk on both about of our a cliffhanger, lists. baby. Yeah. We oh, both yeah. enjoyed it. Talk about yeah. a cliffhanger. Yeah. yeah. Now that's how a cliffhanger yeah. should be. Well, I do think. Well, just just to your point, like Severance broke through in part because it's also easier for people to be like. Oh my God, it's this mystery and there's a cliffhanger at the end. Like if I come up, I, me on this podcast, I know, I know the truth. I'm telling you about this poignant, heartfelt, Korean mm -hmm. historical drama mm -hmm. that's going to make you feel- Two different sets of subtitles. Like Korean and different Japanese color. subtitles. Right, right. I know that <laughs> one of those descriptions make you be like, wow, I got to see what the cliffhanger is. The other one's like, my mom might watch that one time. But that's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. We got one more show, and I'm excited to talk about this show because I just love how happy the whole team making it seems to be. They love each other, and they love the show's success. And, like, every time they're up for awards or anything, they're just, they feel like a family that loves each other so much. And this is the team behind Reservation Dogs, uh, both of y'all's picks for one of the best shows of the year. Tell folks what it is. Uh, probably every week of Reservation Dogs, I had some sort of tweet that was like, this was the best episode of Reservation yeah. Dogs yet, and yet it was always applicable. Yeah. <laughs> like, it was just a wonderful, wonderful second season. Uh, it is about a group of teenagers, of indigenous teenagers who live on a reservation, and it is about their lives and their friendship and sort of them growing up within this community with which they have a complicated relationship. Should they stay on the reservation? Should they move? What do they want to do with their lives? You know, if you go... You're not going to be able to do weird stuff with your friends anymore. Well, they're going to. It's mostly their idea. And Daniel's. They're grappling with the suicide of their friend who had wanted them to all travel to California together. Hey, Laura. Would you ever want to go to California with me? California? Yeah. Always wanted to go. Yeah. And so the second season, I think, takes some interesting leaps forward in the characterization of these four teens and sort of what they value and what they see for themselves. And then to Catherine's point of sort of maybe both of us being suckers for sentimental endings, this season has a very gorgeously done sentimental ending that sort of speaks to who you grow up to be and how you yeah. get there. Yeah. But it's very funny and goofy while also sort of having these beautifully, again, sort of poignant messages. Uh, Catherine, I've gushed a lot. What can you say that's smarter no, than what I'm no. saying? Uh, no, I, I, I love this show. This is my favorite show this year. I think, um, it, you know, it does actually exactly the thing that you wish the bear did, Sam, which is okay. that mm -hmm. okay. it is always handing over an episode to a character yes. that has not had a moment yet. Yeah. Um, it is about this group of uh, indigenous teens, and so each of them in turn gets their own in just exquisitely gorgeous single episode where it's really about their experiences. But this season also makes time for 
that same kind of episode about like their moms, their aunties. This being a shit ass. Mm, me too. I don't want to do dishes anymore. Word. No. Y'all ever feel like we just went from being kids to women overnight? Mm -hmm. And no one even asked us. Just there are this incredible tonal range, as as Roxana was saying, like it is very. Um, incredibly sad and poignant and, like, moving at the end. And it is also probably the hardest I laughed at TV this year in a couple different instances. I think the performances are just astoundingly... Uniformly great. Astoundingly mm. great. Except for maybe Mark Maron needs to find a different kind of character to play. But beyond that, like, it is just one of those shows that you watch and, like, nothing else on TV feels anything like it at all, looks anything like it at all, yeah. um, and is anywhere near as consistently astounding. Remember the stories I told you when you were growing up about the people we come from? Generations of medicine people. Caretakers. These are the ones held us together as we arrived from our homelands. Again, specificity, right? The specifics of this place, it feels so precisely rendered. Mm. And the relationships feel so well calibrated on all levels, right? Like Catherine mentioned, you have like the auntie relationships, who they are to each other. Uh, you have parental relationships, you have friend relationships, you have frenemy relationships. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. basically have every kind of relationship, except, interestingly, yeah. we don't really have romantic relationships on this show. Mm. Which yeah. I think is groundbreaking in its own okay. way. Because okay. I think, you know, sometimes a show can fall into the, let's just throw a romance in there. People love love. They'll be, you know, they'll be caught up with that. But Reservation Dogs so far has avoided that. And I think it's a very smart way to go. And I also think something that this show does really well is, like, it loves pop culture. Mm. Like, it yeah. loves other movies. It loves other TV shows. Mm. And so there's just this generalized warmth that comes through in the references that they make. I love it. It's just it. sort of a really yeah. well thought out yeah. uh, combination. The Lord, the creator, he, she... They, whatever your pronouns may be, we ask you to bless this food and the people that cooked it. We know our friend Dolores here is having a hard time right now as her grandma transcends into that place in the great beyond. In a galaxy far, far away. All right, we have gone through y'all's three favorite shows of the year. I have cleared the air about how I feel about the bear. <laughs> but before we close, <laughs> I do want to ask if in watching all of this TV this year, did you see any particular big trends? Trends in the best shows or trends in the worst shows, a direction TV might oh, be God. headed? Who knows? Who yeah, knows, big man? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think the trends that I don't like are the ones that, I mean, I think we have all complained about this in various forums and in different places, but the increasing uh, emphasis on IP-driven things that we have seen in other plate, like it's a Star Wars show, it's a mm -hmm. Marvel show, it's a Lord of the Rings show, it's a Game of the Game of Thrones show, like if we, where the bets feel conservative. Now, that said, it is possible to make great TV inside of what looks like a conservative bet. And Andor is it. Okay. Andor is an incredible Star Wars TV show. It's possible. So in spite of my deep pessimism, there are these examples out there where you're just like, but it, but you could still do it. <laughs> you can still make Andor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what we have talked about before, and Sam, you've talked about it before, is sort of true crime mm -hmm. IP yeah. felt pretty exhausting this and, year. And like cringy. And it's cringy. clearly, yes. yeah, cringy. It's clearly a sure bet, you know? I mean, the Ryan Murphy shows still get watched, so I think we can sort of 
anticipate those for next year. Uh, but I just think that there has been a little bit more risk taking in a way that I enjoy. Severance felt like a risk. Oh, yeah. Pachinko felt like a risk. Even the bear felt like a risk. Uh, so I'm excited about all of those programs. And I also am sort of excited to feel like we're getting TV that's made about people who are not just like wealthy white people. Yeah. Felt like all of HBO was just like coastal rich white women doing bad things. And I listen, I yes. ate it all up. I sure did. <laughs> sure. I watched all of Nicole Kidman's coats on the undo. <laughs> Um, hey, thank you both so much for talking with me. Uh, we're going to have you back on to talk about the bear season two. Absolutely. Get ready to fight. Yeah. Get ready to fight. Chaos. <laughs> Straight chaos. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thanks again to Roxana Haddadi and Catherine Van Arendonk. You can check out more from their top TV picks this year on Vulture. Culture Geist. Culture Geist. You're listening to Culture Geist. Culture Geist. I don't know, y'all. And now for a segment we're calling Culture Geist. About all the things we can't stop thinking about. The culture that's haunting you, haunting me, haunting all of us, for better or worse. Hi, Sam. This is Brenda. I'm not a huge Bjork fan, but my colleague Ariel turned me on to Bjork's new podcast. It's called Sonic Symbolism, and in her words, it's very cool. In the first episode, she says something about female multiplicity that I cannot stop thinking about. I'm going to play it for you. Like you have all the Smurfs, but you just have one female Smurfette. But to say, okay, I want to be all the Smurfs. You know, like, that's yeah. my rebellion. As a creative, I keep using this phrase in my conversations, and absolutely nobody knows what I'm talking about, except for my colleague. I demand this entry into the cultural lexicon. We want to be all the Smurfs. you be Hi, this is Jennifer from Brooklyn. Uh, my top cultural zeitgeist of all time has got to be the Academy Award February 26, 2017 Oscar broadcast for best picture Jordan Horowitz producer of La La Land La La Land holding the correct best picture envelope out in front of him like a talisman lost, way, but you know guys, guys, I'm sorry no there's a mistake, there's a mistake. amid Moonlight. just ridiculous amounts of chaos and people running around and befuddled Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway and saying in his producer voice this is not a joke Moonlight has won best picture Moonlight best picture it's glorious. My son and I rewatch the uh, video uh, capture of that all the time. We want T-shirts with that. Just how he rose to take control of this wildly unhinged Hollywood situation was wonderful. Also, Moonlight deserved Best Picture. So it was just a double delight for me. Thanks. My name is Jules, and my culture geist comes from... Camilla Cabello's um, truly unforgettable rendition of I'll Be Home for Christmas, or should I say I'll Be Home for Quismois? I'll be home for Quismois. Um, it is all over my TikTok. She has this absolutely unhinged pronunciation of Christmas that I have to say has really grown on me with time. Um, I'll just find myself walking around my apartment singing, I'll be home for Christmas. Um, you gotta check it out. It is truly like nothing else. Thanks again to Jules, Jennifer, and Brenda. My Culture Guys this week, in the spirit of White Lotus, is this old morning show clip of Aubrey Plaza kind of getting into it with Kathy Lee and Hoda 
over whether or not Aubrey was a good NBC page back in the day. Uh, we're escorted away from the page program. Okay, that is not true. By security. <laughs> we heard it was something dramatic. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. You guys are insane. Um, We've been called worse. Everyone. It's kind of unhinged, just like the best of Aubrey Plaza's work. And I love it. She's a queen. Listeners, do you have a culture geist? A thing in the culture that's been haunting you for days or weeks or even years? Share it with us and be specific. The more specific, the better. You can send us a short voice memo at intuit at vulture.com. Also, if you like this show and want to support it, we could use your help. Subscribe to Intuit on your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcast. And most importantly, tell your friends about this show. Share it with your friends. Every little bit helps, and word of mouth is the best advertisement. All right, Intuit is hosted by me, Sam Sanders. The show is produced by Janae West, Travis Larchuk, Gabby Grossman, and Jelani Carter. Our fearless editor is Jordana Hochman. Our engineer is Daniel Turek. Our music is composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. And Hannah Rosen is the editorial director of audio at New York Magazine. All right, we are back next Thursday with a new episode. Till then... Catch up on the White Lotus. Just catch up on it. Trust me. It's it, it's good. <laughs>